Yeah. Get started. I, I, I think we're good. good. So whenever you guys are ready, I think we're ready. Yeah. Okay. And thanks for doing it. <laughs> Um, welcome, everyone. Today, I am pleased to introduce my esteemed colleague and good friend, Luis Navarro. Uh, Luis is a fourth year PhD student at the O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs with a major in public finance and a minor in policy analysis. Uh, before coming to IU, he received his bachelor's in economics at the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México. Uh, Luis's general research areas include public finance and public economics with a focus on fiscal federalism, local tax policy, and the municipal bond market. He's also an excellent cook, a dog person, and a Swifty for life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you Very for lead. this. Uh, <laughs> Sorry if I, uh, at oh, some no. point the, my voice is not necessarily coming through. I am covering for a, so a little sorry. bit of the, this weird, uh, you know, weather changes. Uh, but first, uh, thank you for being here, for coming uh, to my presentation. And also, as always, thanks for the Austrian Workshop community, you know, for uh, giving this space for to talk about my research. Mm -hmm. And today I'll be talking about uh, one of my dissertation chapters, uh, which gets at the, which is titled Preference for Local Public Goods and the Gig Economy. I have been working this for the al almost uh, the last eight months, so I will give you the last update of this research project. And um, this research project is uh, getting at the, it will be looking at the gig economy or the sharing economy. And let me first define this. Uh, so the gig economy, it's uh, these new platforms that have developed in the past the almost decade, uh, well, sorry, two decades, that we are already very familiar with. Like with, this is Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, DoorDash, and they are called the gig or sharing economy. The, the gig part, <coughs> sorry, it's because um, people supplying labor in these uh, markets or platforms uh, do not necessarily hold a uh, like a contractual relationship with uh, the like th these platforms, they, they, so they operate as intermediaries that connect to the suppliers and consumers. <clears throat> and it's called the sharing economy because uh, people engaging in these activities usually have some idle asset which in which they can use to get an, an additional revenue stream. And if they could, uh, people consume or like people buying this can uh, benefit from the consumption of data. Like an example is if, people that are listing a spare room in Airbnb or like people that do uh, that began doing carpooling and then like it led to Uber. Mm -hmm. And the pre in the recent uh, years that these um, platforms have been in the market, they, they had shaped significantly the way the, the some key markets operate. And I want to give some context. For example, um, this piece, this recent piece by CNN, <clears throat> Uh, looks at the number of workers that had been uh, like uh, that report that work that uh, obtained some earnings from the these um, you know uh, gig uh, activities and in just this five year period they had grown like uh, almost five times by the beginning of 2017 we had like roughly 1.2 million people supplying labor here and by the end of 2022 sorry by the then the end of 2020 it's almost five million people so. They have showed an accelerated growth in a relatively short period of time. Um, this is also the case, for example, for Airbnb, which will be the main platform I will be talking today. Um, this graph, uh, the main takeaway I want you to get from this is that, again, like in this five-year period from 2017, 2017 to 2022, uh, we began with uh, roughly 2.1 million uh, houses listed in Airbnb, and by the uh, almost the end of 2022, they are uh, uh, around six million. So the, the people have like gained a lot of interest on uh, participating in these new activities, and it has changed the way, for example, how transportation and housing uh, operate. And since these activities, by the very nature, they uh, the, like the the type of markets they target. Uh, that, that entails that some local governments uh, uh, issue some regulations and some taxes that apply to them. And that has created, since this is mostly regulated by local governments, it creates a very heterogeneous setting in which we have differences in the way some governments uh, you know, address these, these activities. 
and um, and it creates some sort of polycentric network in the way this market uh, these uh, units interact. And I want to show you this uh, recent news that I found as I was pre preparing the presentation, where in, in West Lafayette, just a couple hours away from here, now they are having some discussions with the uh, Board of Sonina Pills because people there are concerned about the number of, of units that keep uh, being like being listed in in Airbnb, and there are concerns about like the quality of the school district, the the, the neighbors in this uh, Tip Canoe County um, has been uh, you know getting some discussions on what's the role this uh, this the presence of these markets should be, and and this is like 2024, so this is uh, on an ongoing thing. And in this paper, I will not necessarily be looking at that specific factor, but I will be examining the mechanisms through which preferences for local public goods influence the decision to participate in the gig economy or in these new activities. In particular, I will be looking at how results from a school bond referendum, that is like the elections that the school districts call in order to uh, issue debt to, for capital improvements, um, Determine, to determine the incentives to participate, that is like to enter or exit these platforms. And the, the, the key part that I will be looking here is that the school zone referenda capture differences on constituents' preferences for local public goods, in particular, uh, pro like education provided by the, by the school district. Um, the paper is divided in, in, in two main parts. First, I do a theoretical examination of this phenomena by using the network of adjacent action situations framework. And then I will do some empirical analysis uh, looking at the results from school districts bond referendums from California and Texas between 2014 and 2019. And let me begin this talk maybe with the, 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 the result from applying the network of adjacent action situations framework and describe you quickly how I theorize these mechanisms uh, could take place. So I identify five, uh, five action situations that capture the main things happening in, in this phenomenon. So we have the county government property tax management. So county governments are usually the ones that, uh, one of the governments that levy property taxes, and they are the ones that manage it and, and uh, are in charge that all the houses or all the, the homes uh, receive their property tax liabilities. The property, the, the housing market, for the purpose of this analysis, I segmented in two, in two arms. We have on, on the left-hand side, the housing and long-term rental market. So you have here all your residents and all the people that are, you know, have a lease. And uh, usually these people uh, uh, can, pro can consume education provided by the school district. So it's people that have, have kids and they will be sent here. They, they send their kids to, to the school and the school provides some, some education. At this, in the other leg of the market, we have the hotel and short-term rental market. Here we have all the housings, uh, housing units that are uh, consumed for tourist purposes. Here we have uh, the short-term rental market. In particular, it's the, the Airbnb market. And the, the main distinction between this, that I made between these two is that while the, the long-term market uh, provide, uh, consumes education, the short-term one does not. However, these two markets, or like the residents in these two markets, uh, or sorry, the owners of homes in these two markets, both participate or uh, <laughs> participate in the in the school district referendums. So they have some decision power on what the, what will be the level of the property tax burden experience in this whole jurisdiction. So let me just guide you through something I really liked about using this framework is that provides a cool way of looking at the propagation mechanisms of a policy change. So let me just exemplify how could, could this work. Imagine that there is a change in the uh, in the in the property tax. So the the county government will uh, impose taxes for both uh, legs of the market. Uh, then, if the school district provides uh, like calls for an election. Then these the, the owners in these two legs can uh, in those two uh, legs of the market can cast votes and that what the decision of that election could translate into a new level of taxes experienced by the consumers in this market and that could uh, lead to a new uh, just a new equilibrium in the housing market and that could lead to adjustments in the prices uh, observed uh, by consumers here. So, 
in, in the paper, I go and explain like all the uh, the characteristics of each individual action situations. For the purpose of this presentation, I will just enunciate some of the main takeaways that uh, play a determinant role in how these uh, out in the in the outcomes observed in each action situation. Uh, in terms of property tax administration, uh, there are just uh, things that stand out. Well, first, property taxes differ significantly uh, from other taxes levied by governments. Unlike the sales tax or the income tax, governments do not set a property tax rate. What they set is a target on the property tax liabilities, mm -hmm. and then the uh, uh, the property tax rate is determined implicitly once you observe the appraisal value of the homes. So this is usually called the residual view of property taxes. And an implication it has is that allows for fiscal illusion. What do I mean with here is that people do not necessarily um, uh, understand properly how the, the changes in the property, like how the changes in, in policy refer, reflect into their property tax rate. And an example of this would be like, for example, the, the government can increase the property tax uh, revenues. It, and by decrease and still decrease the tax rate if the increase in the property tax revenues is lower than the the increase in the price in the value of homes because the property tax rate like it's like a fraction so like if the numerator increase uh, less than the denominator then the property tax rate uh, decreases but they still they can uh, raise revenues while reducing the tax rate um at the same time County, county governments are not the only ones that are uh, that could levy a property tax. School districts are also uh, government units that uh, uh, could impose a, or could levy a property tax, which is used mainly to finance uh, the provision of education. And these, since the, we have more than one government that is tapping into this uh, into this tax base. It creates a common pool resource, or like it highlights that the tax base operates as a common pool resource. Mm -hmm. And here, like the two, how can we identify this? Because government fiscal autonomy, that means that the count, for example, the county government cannot prevent the school district from uh, increasing property taxes. This means that there is non excludability in consumption from the uh, property tax base. At the same time, uh, since the con constituents respond to taxation and Changes in, in, for example, increases in the tax rate or in the tax in the tax level uh, could lead to a decrease in their consumption of housing. This means that there is final tolerance to taxation, which translates to subtractability of use. Each additional, uh, you know, uh, tax dollar raised by the county government is a tax dollar that could not be raised by the school district. So property taxes um, are oh, like are governed by these. Uh, by this type of dynamics. Uh, in terms of the housing and rental markets, um, we you might be familiar that the school district quality is one of the main determinants considered when shopping for uh, the location of your house. And um, the intuition behind this uh, can be traced back to, um, you know, in, in public economics to the concept of tibu sorting. So, which in, in, in a nutshell means that constituents shop for the school district that maximizes their preferences for the joint consumption of housing and education. So um, this highlights the, the, rele <clears throat> sorry, the relevant role of property tax capitalization on home values. What this means is that, uh, for example, if the school district uh, it spends more on the quality of education. Some people might want to go more to, to this school district. Then that could translate that that increase in property taxes that translated to an increase in the quality of public services provided at your jurisdiction could reflect in, in larger home price um, home prices. So um, that means like the increase in taxes capitalized to the to home value. And um, with the introduction of these home sharing platforms, it created uh, some change in the dynamics observed by the supply by the, the suppliers in this market. Why? Because now landlords that usually uh, you know just let, uh, list their units to people that were like looking for housing now can change and instead of like looking to lease their homes like for a year period, they can just supply it in Airbnb and maybe get a higher. Uh, 
a higher source of uh, like uh, more income. This goes at the exp uh, maybe at the with the trade off that you ha you face now more demand risk. Like the the benefit of the home of the long term rental market is that you can secure some income for a year. In Airbnb, you might be looking for just like your weekend uh, bookings, but you can you can usually charge a higher price depending on how these uh, forces take place in different markets. There will be some changes, like there could be some landlords that are shifting from the long term to the short term market, which could lead to changes in the prices at which people access uh, housing. And of course, that access uh, short term rentals. And um, regarding bond referendums, um, there are a couple of things that I want to highlight. First, um, referendum results, uh, as you know, they are determined both by the propensity to participate in the election and the direction of the vote. It's like how many people go to vote and, the, and whether they vote to approve or reject. The direction of the vote is determined by the heterogeneity in the preference for local public goods. Like the main idea here, for example, is that um, residents that have kids might have more, like, that are, would, could be more likely to accept a, a referendum since they, like, they could, like, directly, like, um, you know, capture the that extra dollar they pay on taxes will benefit the, the education provided to their kids. Uh, for Airbnb host, that might not be the case because they are not consuming that specific. And the referendum results will change the property tax levy faced by all households, regardless whether they vote and regardless whether they uh, take the direction of the vote. And this will uh, lead to an adjustment in, in the, you know, some of the markets that I highlighted in, in the network. It will change the prices observed by uh, for housing. It will change the quality of the education provided by the school district. And it will change the property tax revenues collected by the county government and the, uh, the school district. So um, there is a challenge in this collective choice problem. Uh, that stems from the discrepancies between who is eligible to vote and who is uh, consuming that good. And this is uh, very uh, neatly described by uh, the paper of, by Cellini and co-authors, where they, they uh, label it as absentee landlords, which is like some people have an Airbnb, but that Airbnb might not be in the district that they are registered to vote. Like, for example, you can live here in Bloomington, but you have your summer house in Florida. You can let it for Airbnb, but you are not necessarily registered to vote in Florida in the Florida school district. So um, this could like uh, this creates some complexity in the way the election results map to the preferences of of constituents toward uh, public goods. So with this all this setting, uh, I will. So that's the part with the theoretical examination. So it's a co it's a quite complex uh, phenomena, and for the empirical part, I am looking specifically for what is the effect that a bond approval has on the incentives to participate to participate or supply on the short term rental market. That is on Airbnb. I will look, be looking at this uh, using data from uh, school district bond referendums in Texas and California. I will be also, as any empirical work, I need to merge several data sets to answer my question. So I will be using uh, data from RDNA that it's a, it's a uh, proprietary website that goes and scrapes all the information on the Airbnb website. So here I have a really uh, complete measure of the number of units listed in Airbnb uh, during this period. Um, data from bond referendums is widely available at the uh, Department of like, in the government websites from California and Texas. And as I want to capture also uh, possible determin possible uh, determinants of the decision to supply in Airbnb driven by the other components in the network, I will be looking for some school district characteristics uh, using data from the ACS. And I am comparing these two states because they have two, bear, two different settings in which school districts operate. In Texas, all school districts are uh, have the or like have the form of an independent school district that they have more more uh, autonomy, both in the way they provide uh, education and also fiscal autonomy uh, relative to the 
uh, upper levels of government, I mean states and counties, whereas in California, we have elementary, secondary, and unified school districts that have, uh, at least relative to Texas, less autonomy in which they conduct these decisions. So comparing these results could shed some light on like how the institutional setting in which the school districts operate shapes the outcomes observed in the school district bond referendums. Um, and so for my empirical setting, I am in particular looking at the effect that the school districts have on the uh, short-term rental market. So I will be looking to estimate some parameter beta of this effect. Um, but as this uh, network uh, shows, there are some empirical challenges that I will face if I try to estimate this like in a, let me say, a standard way. For example, if I run a regression on just the results of bond referendums on a measure of Airbnb supply, this could be, uh, this could uh, be, suffer from reverse causality. And intuitively, it is because, as uh, this has raised, has been raised in, in this forum a couple of times, the Airbnb supply could, could be determined the direction of the vote. If there is a, a, bunch, a bunch of people supplying Airbnb and they are registered voters there, then like they can actually influence the, the vote. And like the, the networks uh, highlights this. Like any effect that the school districts have on hotel, hotel and short rental markets, we operate through the propagation mechanisms that happen through property taxes and equilibrium in the in both legs of the housing market. So, um, the literature looking at uh, the school uh, at bond referendums uh, usually or like uh, has been successful using regression discontinuity designs as a as a quasi uh, as a research design to address these uh, these challenges and the main intuition behind this uh, this idea is that you can do comparisons around the cutoff for bond approval which will be basically comparing school districts with narrow approvals and narrow rejections of the the proposal so the strength of, of this research design is that for a small bandwidth, like, you know, for near the, the like, for example, if this is a majority rule, near the 50% cutoff, assignment to treatment, that means like whether you observe an approval or a rejection, conditional on, on some covariates, could be as good as random. So this mimics the conditions observed in a laboratory experiment where the only difference between the Airbnb supply of the school districts below and above the cutoff could be explained by the outcome of the, of the election. So just to uh, highlight how this, uh, like how the intuitively the regression discontinuity will work, I, here I'm showing uh, each uh, a scatter plot where each dot is a referendum. And on the, on the horizontal axis, I am plotting the distance to for cutoff approval. Here, the the the, the black solid line at uh, center of zero, it's like the cutoff for rejection or, or or approval. So, and as you can see, there are uh, there are some elections that are won by like an overwhelming majority or rejected by like a large distance from the cutoff. But there are some elections that are like, for example, between five like a margin of five percent or 10%. And the idea of the regression discontinuity is that if I would like, like the, that uh, the, the election, the school districts that are in, around this cutoff, like whether they land in an approval or a rejection, uh, like in the absence of manipulation, uh, this could be a condition, think, thought as like as a, as a random assignment. Well, super clever. What do you have on the vertical axis here? Uh, on the so it's just the, the result of the election. So it's okay, okay, okay. So the, like yeah, sorry. The, here it's like the the election that got passed. Here are the elections that got failed, that got rejected. Um. So while this ah uh, like in in referendums the regression discontinuity has shown to be a, a like a, a strong uh research design for this particular setting has some limitations. First, it fails to account to the dynamic nature of referendums. Like some people looking at the school districts like often make the case that you can think them as repeated games. Uh, and the idea is that school districts can hold elections sequentially. So like each semester, like for example, in Texas and California, I observed that they call to elections twice a year. So the school district can uh, propose an election two times a year. Sometimes uh, they can observe different results. The, the, sometimes the bond proposal can get rejected, get good approved. 
some issues might get voted more than once. Like if you get, you might reject a proposal in January, but then propose it again, uh, like in, in the future, and you can observe an approval. So if in policy evaluation terms, what does it mean? That the school districts can observe multiple treatments, so they can observe uh, like sequential approvals, and they can switch between treatment and controls. So sometimes if you are like, imagine that you at some point uh, you can reject an election for a, with a 49%, and in the, <laughs> uh, the next year you approve it with a 52%. So if I try to study this with uh, this type of research design, I could have some uh, units that are uh, treated, but uh, will appear in my control group. And um, to address that, I am using a different research design, uh, which is a stack difference in difference model. So here, the idea is I will be comparing between school districts with approvals and rejections before and after the election takes place. And it's called a stacked uh, model because uh, since ele elections happen uh, in, in, a, like, in a specific period of time, like twice a year, uh, I can create, uh, like for in the in the literature, there are sometimes referred as focal elections that they could you can think, think about as a sub experiments. So, like in a, a specific period of time, I will have a school some school districts that call to an election. Those elections can get passed, passed or fail. So, uh, and the idea of stacking this is that I instead of measuring this in in calendar time, I will be measuring in in, in periods relative to the intervention of like for number of months until the election takes place. And the uh, strength of this is that uh, it's a natural way to control for the fact that some units could appear multiple times. So I can have a school district that appears in one sub-experiment and then it can appear in the second sub-experiment. And here, this type of model uh, naturally introduces that panel dimension, that the fact that the same school district could appear multiple times. And the improvement or like the 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 improvement that I'm making to this particular research design is that based on the idea of the regression discontinuity, I will build the treatment and control groups using the distance for cut of a, for uh, for uh, for the approval of the bond. So, uh, like in my control group, I will have all the sc school districts with narrow rejections, and in the treatment group, uh, districts with uh, narrow approvals. So, it's a uh, it is borrowing from the strengths of both research designs in order to to answer this question. Uh, just to uh, show a little bit on my on the data I'm using for elections, there I have roughly 1,600 uh, bond elections from California and Texas. Um, they will be taking place from 2014 and 2019. Uh, if you, like just the thing that I want to highlight, most of them got passed. So this is a problem that I am still looking of how to uh, improve. That the fact that I, I am comparing between a bunch of approvals and just few few rejections. Um, and also, in for some cases, particularly in California, uh, the, I have few observations that have like this <laughs> a narrow approval or rejection. Uh, the the results are tend to be like more uh, decided, either the approval or the rejection. And let me just to uh, double down on how this uh, stacked uh, model works. So here I have a visual representation of how the elections could take place. So like, let's say I have uh, an election that happens in January 2015. So uh, like to analyze this, I will be looking six months before and six months after the election. So it's like from July to May. Then I have another election in June 2015. I will be looking at from January to December, so on and so forth for all the, the periods from 2014 to 2019. And the stacking. What this does is basically doing this. It's like centering everything, changing the, the time for reference in periods relative to the referendum. And then I center them, uh, like stack them upon each other and create a sample from which I will be estimating the model and then create this uh, panel structure that accounts for uh, the number of school districts that could appear multiple times. And uh, in terms of the main dependent variable that I am using for the analysis, it's I built a measure of exit of the Airbnb market. So this is a binary variable that equals one if the Airbnb unit was not listed on the Airbnb website on a given month. So um, here I am restricting the sample a little bit. I am only considering units that were listed 12 consecutive months before the election took place 
Why I'm doing this? Because as you might imagine, some supply might be seasonally. Like you can supply your, at uh, least your house only the summer because you might be going there like over the fall. So uh, like some of these, uh, like this could add some noise to my estimation. So here, like if I uh, restrict to this, I am only looking at this or like, uh, or I, I theorize that I am looking to the, to the hosts that are like, uh, more committed or like that use this as a uh, main source of, of income. And the implication is that I might be analyzing the most inelastic part of the supply curve. Like they are less responsive to changes in the property tax burden. And since I am using a binary variable, this has a, um, an easy interpretation as a probability model on the probability of exiting the market. And just uh, quickly, I will be running as in any difference in difference design, uh, the, the stacked model in which my main dependent variable or my main independent variable is the interaction, whether you were treated and the, the post variable that reflects the periods after the intervention. And uh, to look for the dynamic uh, effects of the, of, the, of the election, as well as possible anticipation that could happen. I am running an event study, which is just like the dynamic specification of this. Uh, in terms of the control variables, I try to look for variables that uh, capture the main elements of the action situations that uh, are involved in my, in my model. So I have some socioeconomic variables on the uh, percentage of population that is female, uh, black, the median age, the median household income. I also computed the property tax rates observed by, by the school districts. Uh, I have the school enrollment per capita and the number of housing units uh, per capita by the school district. And uh, to control for the characteristics of the referendum, I include the amount of the proposal, uh, like the amount of the bond proposal uh, normalized by the number of students enrolled in the school district. And just to, to illustrate my dependent variable, uh, so here it's like uh, here you can see uh, the my main the, the dependent variable. It's the <laughs> when it's zero, it means that all units uh, were listed uh, on the market, and uh, as the election approaches, there could be some change in the in the in the propensity to to supply. This change, as it's just like an unconditional analysis, it's saying just like the proportion of units that stop being listed after some date, but is not necessarily reflecting the you know the causal effect of the election. For that, I will I run the the model and, and compute the, the event studies. And just to to get quickly through that, uh, here I'm showing first the results for Texas. I am showing four models. The first one is all the referendums, and then I estimate the model at different bandwidths. And a couple of things that stand out for the Texas case, I, I observe a positive effect of the referendum on the uh, probability of exiting. So that means upon a bond approval, then there is an increase in the probability of exiting the market associated with this result. Uh, uh, something that is uh, that, that stood out from, from this analysis is that uh, I do find like this, uh, this shape where there is an increase in the probability that then attenuates a little bit as the next election comes. I do uh, cap this window for five to six months just to ensure that they am, I am not overlapping with the next election and I don't have like some contamination from the, the further experiment that will take place. Also something that stands out in this, in, in this exercise is that as I uh, restrict the bandwidth, so for example, as I reduce from 10 to 7.5 to five, the estimated effect it becomes larger. So this suggesting that uh, for, for the uh, school districts that are more close to the curve for approval, that could be like, um, you know, let me, let me say, more undecided by the preferences for, for this uh, increase in property tax burden, uh, they are, could observe like a, a larger response to this policy or to this, uh, to this result. For California, I have a lot of problems. So, um, and, and uh, for example, here I do observe like a, a across the board and an immediate decrease in the probability followed by an increase. Um, 
However, I would say I do at this point I do not fully trust these results. Why? Because in with California, I have a, a, a problem with the balancedness of the of the panel. I, I don't have enough observations at each sub, at each experiment to compare the before and after. It works in when I stack them up as I am comparing the rejections and approvals at different moments in time. But if I look at each sub experiment, the, the model is not able to estimate precisely. So um I still need to be working on how to, to deal with this problem. Um, just I will summa, uh, to summarize my, my results in terms of the, the Texas results, at least, uh, I want to highlight here the, the mean of the dependent variable. So that's like the proportion of Airbnbs that are not listed in the sample at some moment in time here. Uh, and this allows to for some context in the interpretation of my results. For example, in, my, in the 7.5% margin, on average, I observed that at some point in the in, in my analysis window, 30% of the of the units are not listed in Airbnb. They drop for some reason. I estimate an increase of 16 per of 16% in the probability of exiting the market. That means that after the election, this 30% of the proportion of units not listed could increase from 30 to 46%. That's a large estimate. I am a uh, Part of my further work will be adding some robustness check to verify whether this large estimate uh, actually uh, makes sense. Uh, the fact that I, do, I would, would highlight is that uh, for Texas, I do find statistically significant results across the board from all the mar for like the different margins. So that's always encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, in turn, I, I will just uh, try to go uh, quickly through this too, so we can go to the Q and A. Um, here, the, in the regression discontinuity literature, they use as an identification assumption the, a, a manipulation at the cutoff test. Then the basic idea is that the that be, like you want to check whether people are not self-selecting into the treat into one of the treatment like one of the, either the treatment or the control group before the intervention. So you want to test whether the continuity or where, sorry where the density of the of the votes is continuous at the cutoff. For Texas, it's, it's like uh, I can uh, like it seems to be uh, to be like California fails this test, which is uh, surprisingly. I, I all the time that I see this work, usually all, like you don't observe like failures of this. Uh, however, there is some uh, there are some recent literature that tries to make the case of why why you can observe this and goes basically at the idea that the school district officials can uh, you know target information about the school, the, the, the referendum that could uh, be uh, interpreted as some sort of manipulation. So um, again, like also after seeing this, my trust on the California estimates is still uh, not fully gained. Um, how many in time? Okay, just uh, here quickly in the also as part of to to add for the threads or oh, like the. For the internal validity of this uh, design, you want to compare whether some main that's one of the main determinants for the uh, decision on the on the election uh, whether they are similar between the treatment and the control arm, such that you say like the main differences be the main difference between these two is the bond referendum. Here in the sample with the seven point five percent margin, like these are like the the main. Uh, the control variables I use for the regression, um, I do find some differences in, in the in the full sample. Uh, here, I what I would say is that the uh, uh, while for Texas I don't find um, necessarily significant differences mm -hmm. for California I do. So here I'm just showing the like the joint results. I will split them to clarify this but at least uh like the fact that i do find significant differences could be telling me that uh there might be another like some hidden thing that might be driving my results um but again like this is something that i will be keep, keep improving and um well i, I just uh, said this i will conclude with uh so in this paper i i use the network of adjacent action situations to identify all the possible propagation mechanisms on how a school bond referendums translate into changes in the Airbnb supply at the school district level. 
Um, so individual supply in this market might have different uh, preferences for the for the education provided by the school district, and this reflect some attitudes toward the governments operating in their locations. Um, there is a challenge that I still I cannot solve, which is the absentee landlords problem. Uh, I I am looking to introduce the like to look for data on on voters to see if I can characterize the sociodemographic. Uh, you know, uh, characteristics of the people that are eligible, are registered voters, both in Texas and California, to see whether they map to the uh, characteristics observed at the school district level. And in terms of the next steps that I will be doing for this research, um, First, I, I mentioned this uh, Cellini et al. paper. So this paper got uh, really well published and, and, and cited because they looked at California bond, uh, school districts and they proposed a new uh, a new estimator on the regression discontinuity that accounts for this panel structure. So it's like a, some sort of dynamic version of it. As I keep reading their paper and looking at mine, I think that we are doing very similar things, but just labeling in different terms. I think like there might be some sort of equivalence between the two approaches. So I, I am trying to look at first, like implement that estimator, compare it with my results, and maybe draw some cl conclusions on why, uh, what are the similarities and differences between the two. And also, uh, they do propose a theoretical model that looks at the joint decision of housing and education and how it translates to both results. I am trying, I, what I will do is extend that model to explicitly uh, uh, characterize people that are residents and people that are Airbnb hosts and, and get to put potential differences in their propensity to vote driven by this. And that being said, that's all. So I appreciate your attention and I hope you like it. Excellent. I can help moderate along if that's helpful. Oh, thank yeah. You. I will moderate the queue. So, yep. so <laughs> really interesting paper. Thank you. Earlier versions of it. Is this, uh, when I think of gig economy, I think of individual laborers going from one job to another. Are there being beasts like that, or are they, is it a, a more of a conventional commercial enterprise? Is it more like a, just a very short leasehold? <laughs> so um, in the Airbnb market, uh, so far, I can identify like let me say two types of uh, two types of suppliers. So we have like the like the ones that are more like the 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 let me say like the the gig economy that is like people like you and me that have some uh, additional house that could be listed and that could be not necessarily listed the full year. It's just like when you are not using it your your summer house. There are also like. Uh, what in, in other papers they refer as gig investors, which is like real estate developers that build like a large community of houses where all are listed as an Airbnb. So um, for this analysis, I am looking at both, like uh, for both like people that hold multiple units and uh, people that only hold like uh, like one. Uh, so in that sense, I am not making any differentiation, but uh, in terms of the proportions, as far as I, 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 it has been a while since I checked this statistic, but uh, it is not the, the majority are like these uh, just individual like people that only have like one property and listed as a as an Airbnb. Like the the gig investor is not that prevalent. I don't know if that gets at your question. Mm -hmm. It's super related to this. So I, I was well, it's all super super interesting paper. So I was trying to understand uh, more the. Uh, the mechanism and the logic yeah. here, okay? So uh, essentially this is a, a rise in property taxes, though. No? Yes. So, okay, good. So for those that, that already owns a property, uh, you cannot escape no matter how you use the property, no? Yes. It's for you, uh, rent it, sell it, whatever, and you are, go you are going to, uh, so you, you've been hit by a rising tax, sorry, okay? So. Why it should affect how you use it? If all the all the uses uh, have been hit in the same way by the rising tax, 
Yeah. So uh, the way I I I had been I think about that is that for the Airbnb host, the property tax operates as an expense. So uh, the, it, there is this idea that, um, and I, I need to look at more uh, more of this and on the extent to which the property taxes, the property tax liability gets transferred into larger like rental prices that would that could like uh, affect the propensity of people to con to both to supply and to consume in the Airbnb market. Um, so and for some like for some hosts like if the property tax. Uh, uh, increases it could like it could it could become more expensive well not only more expensive like to sorry it could reduce the profitability of of holding that in and uh it could also like change the so another way to think about it it increases the opportunity cost of you holding that property so be oh, no because you have to pay it anyway if you no, but I, I am i am thinking of like you can sell it like, uh, for example, it's like if the property taxes increase, you might be like, you know, maybe I am not getting a, enough money as an Airbnb. There, like, if 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 this reflects an increase in the quality of the school district, there might be some willing buyers that could want that house. So, like, the the opportunity cost of me holding this instead of like selling it uh, in for the at a price that already capitalized this, uh, it change. Do you have any indication that when they fall out of the market, they're actually selling? Uh, in so far, no, because I, for that I will need to. So, and that's the 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 hard part, because for the for the Airbnb data, I can know like the location of the house, and I know uh, like some of the characteristics. I don't have information on the owner. Like for example, ideally, I would like to merge it, for example, with Zillow data, where I can get like uh, data on like whether this property is transacting in the real estate market. Um, but at least in the theoretical mechanism that I have been thinking about, it could reflect into a change of that. Maybe just one follow up. So I think the best way of framing this would be that the the tax produce a mismatch. Essentially, you are a person who are considering offering this in this short term rental, and then now suddenly it's more valuable for a person that wants to live there with kids permanently. Mm -hmm. That's that's what the tax yeah. generated, and that goes to the core of the thing that essentially is affecting what you want to do with this asset. Yeah, like uh, that's the key thing. Right now, we're all increasing taxes for every every activity, every uses of the asset shouldn't affect how I use the asset. No? Yeah, like I, I guess what you are getting is that alternative profit. Yes. That yeah, it, it will reflect two changes between like the proportion the proportion of units that go from the short term to the long term, like maybe. You are not just stop like listing it as an Airbnb, and maybe it becomes more uh, profitable to just get it as a long term lease. Mm. And like, yes, it's uh, exactly. so Janet, and then uh, just for what it's worth, that James uh, has one behind you, too. Hi. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I guess I can go. So, one question I had, and then sort of a couple, two questions that are kind of related. Is there a lag between when the referendum is passed and when they can see the tax and when the tax is imposed is the first. And the second is um, a lot of times taxes get, those kind of taxes get imposed on hotels because yeah. that cost just goes to the consumer. So do you think that that also might be happening where they would just then raise the price of the Airbnb because um, these are tourists or just people coming in and out more quickly and so, they don't see that tax as much. That, that, that's a really good question. So something that I still need to uh, wrap my head around is to which extent changes in property taxes has like some pass through to to comp like to prices in the housing market. Um, I, sorry, and particularly in rental markets, like uh, intuitively there could be some, like if there is an increase in the property tax, then like your landlord could raise like the your rent because you are not necessarily paying that property tax. And that also that will apply to hotels to, on the extent to which the Airbnb is more effective, like passing through that tax relative to the hotel that could change like some of the uh, equilibrium in the short rental market that like some people might like, uh, for example, it's like if you have, uh, in Airbnb, you can also have like bed and breakfasts, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. and also that's at some other complexity that in I do not study in this paper, but in another project that I'm using Airbnb data, that it's uh these are also subject to different sales taxes and lodging taxes that could differ across uh, jurisdictions. So that also plays uh, some role. 
And uh, what was you asked another thing? I think oh, if there was a lag between. Oh Lord yes. Uh, <laughs> so there is. Um, I am like uh, right now. I am not sure like the the length of that lag in the sense of like I like. Uh, as far as I understand property taxation so far, is that it will like the, the effect will be visible on the next fiscal year after the election. So that will depend on when the election took place. Uh, I, as far as I understand, these uh, do not necessarily are retroactive changes. So, so they usually will go through the next year. So uh, uh, that's a good comment, actually, because that might change. Like, I, I would say that. Uh, Arguably, the stack difference in difference models should account for that because I am centering everything around the the period the the election period, and um, and also like the, the whole idea there is that this mechanism could be just capturing like the information at notch provided by the market, not necessarily like the actual tax liability, like the level of the tax liability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So I'm curious if you're if you've looked at the difference in rural versus urban. Uh, Airbnb locations because it seems like there's a lot of ways to um, minimize your tax burden in, mm -hmm. in a rural setting. Mm -hmm. A lot of land can be agricultural. A lot of you know, I think about Brown County. Um, even though the properties are forested, there's still part, uh, still agriculture, um, and so you can really reduce your property burden or your property tax burden. Um, and I, I'm not very familiar with urban settings. And so I, I could just see there being a major difference in sort of like these rural amenities that people are after that then end up becoming like, you know, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park that, or that, that area of, of Tennessee, North Carolina mm -hmm. has, has an amazing amount of tourist rentals. And so, I mean, how I wonder how those dynamics take place <laughs> in fact, you know, this whole issue. That, that's a really good point. So the, the analysis so far, and uh, I would say for the most literature looking at Airbnb, they mostly look at urban areas, and that's a byproduct of the uh, results that you observe for Airbnbs. Like Airbnbs are more more likely listed in like high densely populated areas. Yeah. Like uh, for example, uh, for this I don't have the statistic right now, but in another paper where I look at uh, Colorado for a specific, uh, it was eighty five percent of the listings in Colorado were in the Denver metropolitan uh, in the MSA. So like you would have like very few listings that are like in uh, in more rural areas. So uh, another like something that I was looking in like as a potential like robustness check here could be looking at the at how these like uh and like propensity to enter or exit the market could be correlated or explained by the distance of the Airbnb to the schools in the school district and look at like, uh, which that could are maybe capture uh, a little bit of that. Um, in you have a lot fewer houses, like for, you know, density in a rural area, but like if there were a lot of, of vacation homes or Airbnbs, then that can have a really profound effect. Yeah, because also like, I, I, I would say that the results so far capture more the urban thing because, uh, for like given the restriction, the restriction I do on my sample, <laughs> I, I ask for only homes that were listed 12 consecutive months before the election. That uh, with South some school districts that do not necessarily have enough homes that are actively listed. Uh, for uh, just as a maybe uh, you know fact or fun fact on the research. First I began also with Michigan. But Michigan actually got dropped because of this. Like most of my school districts in Michigan that observe an election, uh, well, uh, were dropped out because they didn't have enough homes that were actively listing in 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 this place. Yeah. So so yeah. yeah of course. We have Charlie and Brenda. So I think you get to choose Charlie which one. <laughs> okay. So just online there was uh, Brenda was just asking about. And feel free to chime in, Brenda, if you'd prefer. Um, just suggesting here about adding a little control variable. She's coming on. Oh, sorry, Brenda. Yeah, feel free to elaborate. We'll save the chat as well. Oh, I'm sorry, you're on mute. Yeah, Luis, great presentation. It was a really interesting topic. I didn't see a political control variable. So correct me if it if there is one, but I didn't see one. Uh, so I think that was my suggestion. But then I was also curious because there's variation within within uh, states on the taxes on their Airbnbs, both Texas and California tax at the state level, but then there's variation. 
So I was really curious about that variation, especially when you add in the, I think the, I could, I don't know who made the point just before, but you know, those, those places in the state that are high tourism areas, versus those places in the state which may not get that much tourism. I guess that's a different point than the urban rural, but it still fits with lots of natural beauty. And I was wondering if there was any uh, any way to factor that in, some kind of um, like tourist destination popularity or something, because it varies quite a bit within the states. Yeah, so that, that's a really good point. Uh, thank you. Like for the political control, that, that's a, a good suggestion. I, I will add it. I am looking for data also like on the on the voters, but as a maybe as a quick proxy, I can include, uh, I'm sorry, I can look at that camera. <laughs> uh, I can look at the results of the maybe gubernatorial election or the Congress election. In terms of like the results of the school district, a problem is that data is not that available and the lower turnout do not necessarily, like could add some um, measurement complexities. In terms of the taxation level, that's a good point. And I think it's that naturally, naturally addressed in my uh, model because I am, and I sorry I did not uh, went a lot on that, but, um, the structure of my model has some uh, fixed effects that go for property by sub-experiment. So for example, uh, that means that within my uh, sample, all the units in California are subject for the same uh, state sales tax. And since I am controlling for difference, for uh, fixed characteristics at the school district level, that also should include the potential differences in the sales tax levied by the municipality. So I would say that these are uh, already uh, or implicitly controls for the variation uh, driven by that. Uh, the, so yeah, I, I would think that that's that not like, uh, that should be already controlled, but in terms, uh, I would say though, that it will it will be a good descriptive statistic to have to, like just to see like to which extent like these changes in the, because so, here I am looking mostly at the supply of Airbnb, like the by looking at the taxation of uh, say, like for sales taxation that drives more the demand and that like uh, you know maybe that will be like buying like now that I am saying it out loud, uh, I'm not sure if this, this model that looks only at the supply. Uh, sh should necessarily account for that, given that I am not looking at the, for example, the equilibrium variable of how many days these units are actually booked. I am here just looking at the propensity for uh, people to list in the platform, regardless of whether they get booked or not, which that's another issue. Like I have a bunch of units that are listed, but they never get booked. But here, here I am not uh, accounting or adding that variation. Here I'm just looking at whether the host is listing their home in, in the platform. I don't know if that gets at the question. Sure, no, and I, I should probably give Charlie a chance to ask his question, but I'll follow up with the question about tourism. Because I- Oh, I yeah. That on at the end. Yeah, so uh, I know that in other papers, what they have done it's like, uh, for example, there is this uh, successful paper that looks at this in Europe, and they use like TripAdvisor uh, reviews as some proxy of how like uh, like the attraction of the point of a uh, of a region of the city for uh, for Airbnb because you see this is more like the capturing like the tourist uh, demand for housing or for like short term rentals. Um, there is something that I do want to do about that. Because, uh, for example, in some areas, a school, a schools are not necessarily located in tourist areas. It's more like in the metropolitan in large areas where this could overlap. Uh, for I was looking, initially, I was looking to do some small case study of the Houston area, like and look at like uh, where like the, the schools that are located in more attractive zones, uh, observe like a different, like some different propensities to exit the market uh, driven by this that could be associated with this point of uh, like the demand for, uh, for rentals in tourist zones. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I need to get that data. <laughs> so Lewis, I have two questions. First of all, really 
wonderful work. Oh, Thank you. Awesome stuff you're doing. Really impressive. Mm -hmm. um, first question is just related to, well, I guess maybe more directed to your Texas findings. Mm -hmm. um, did you have an a priori hypothesis of what you expected to find and did it play out? Uh, not really, because like uh, uh, when I was, uh, the first formulation of this, it, it opened as an uh, it's an open empirical question because I, there are like theoretical arguments for both sides. So, for example, these results are more consistent with a model where host or Airbnb hosts are responsive to changes in the property tax burden. That the changes in the like the, the school bond, the school district bond referendum, like reflect some change in the uh, tax burden they experience, and that could increase their probability of exiting the market. Observing negative results could be consistent with uh, what in the literature is called the benefit view of property taxation, which is like um, an increase in the, for example, in the quality of the of the public goods provided by the school district could translate to higher home prices. So like people could be, uh, uh, if the higher home prices translated to a larger rental uh, prices that you can charge to people in the Airbnb market, then you can have you can have incentives to enter the market upon an, in an increase in the property tax. So uh, depending on to which extent the it's basically a, a, a small cost benefit analysis. If the increase in the property tax that reflects to changes in the to larger uh, rental prices uh, outweighs the property tax, the increase in the property tax burden, then you ca can have incentives to to list. Okay. So, yeah. And this might be, a, I know we're at time, this might be a nice closing question. Um, I, I, I found it really wonderful, again, I mean, the, the way you're analyzing adjacent action situations, and I haven't really dug into that literature to know how much how much that's been done. But I guess my question is, is to what, to what extent your methodology here it, it, it could be generalized or is it generic and applied to other adjacent action situations? Mm -hmm. It seems like for me, in your dissertation, whatever, this might be a broad impact kind of thing. Um, so I'm just encouraging you on it. I, no, th thank you. No, the, uh, uh, it, like, uh, for example, a comment that my advisor raised at some point uh, that uh, it's something I need to reconcile a little bit in the way I frame the paper. It's like, um, it, if I lean a lot on the empirical part, then I like remove a little bit of the spotlight on the theoretical examination, which provides a good, uh, a, a, like a good description of the complexities. In particular, because uh, the whole idea, for example, if I would run like a, a, a regression discontinuity, is that uh, since I have a random assignment around the cutoff, like then all the endogeneity provided by all the other action situations, it gets already taken care of. So is that uh, arguably I would not necessarily uh, need to spend time explaining it. However, I did uh, all this uh, not only because I got enlightened by the you know <laughs> the work in the workshop, but also because the, the, yeah, in the literature it's not common to observe. <laughs> Usually the papers looking at at this, you just do like some uh, very simple economic model about the like Airbnb supply, but. Uh, it is like the, the, the thing I like about this, it's slightly more agnostic. It's like, hey, I don't know what's happening. I will delineate all the potential things that could be shaping this. And then I, I for example, the way I'm thinking this, the, this diagram, it's more like a, a, a pipeline of the research I want to do. Like in another paper, I will be looking at the effect of like the other way of this arrow. I have another idea of like looking at how it changes a, a school district's outcomes, whether like the, because there is another whole branch of the lit, Airbnb literature that looks at the, and maybe you have heard about this, like the problems with gentrification, that Airbnbs are crowding out residential owners and they you can have some sort, like in the, in the piece of news that I shared before, like there are people even worried about like dying school districts that like as Airbnbs keep going in, then like some like the, the tax revenues per student can uh, can este, well first increase because you have like more Airbnbs but less students. But like if the number of students decrease, then the state support to a school district could decrease. So there is uh, like. Yeah, there is a lot, of, a lot of work that could be done here. If I could just assert one other way of looking at the problem is the problem is now the state has to readjust how it designs tax policy to yes. account for the change in markets, mm -hmm. not necessarily that the markets have to be repressed. Yes. 
No, and that's a good point. Thank you. And um, no, and like yeah, this project. I, I hope this project gets you know keeps uh, growing. And uh, and yeah, I would highlight that something I I would like to um, you know reiterate is that this the, the way I would like to maybe or this could be replicated is to look at other gig uh, markets like how does this looks for Uber and Lyft and like uh, sales taxes which there is a whole discussion even uh, I mean I will I I sadly cannot get into this but like there is another called uh, discussion on like how people how hosts can uh, need to file their income taxes mm -hmm. like and also like because of, also with Uber, like uh, it's uh, th there is a whole per like tax policy is not up to date to these complexities. So that yeah, that's a thing. Terrific. You got a voice very well done. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for moderating, Jim. No, and thank you for all yeah. your comments. We have one final thing: to have prices at which they list because exiting is very is a very extreme thing. Yeah. You can also check at which price they list. Yeah, yeah I, I do have that. Uh, that 